Good evening, everyone, and thank you guys so much for joining us again tonight here on Six Dimensions Facebook Live page. I am Asia Rush. I serve as a maternal health coordinator with Six Dimensions. And for those of you who may be joining us for the first time, Six Dimensions is a Black woman-owned public health agency. We are committed to a world where all communities are healthy. We are committed to health equity and social justice while we strive to create healthier communities. And one of the ways we do that is by hosting the monthly Facebook Lives. Mississippi has one of the highest maternal mortality rates in the nation. And the MMRC, which is the Maternal Mortality Review Committee, they review the deaths of pregnant women within 12 years, of, I'm sorry, 12 months of pregnancy. And the committee was created in Mississippi to combat those health disparities. So the Facebook Lives is essentially a space where we want to empower and educate and advocate for Black women on different maternal uh, topics that we discuss so that we can reduce maternal mortality rates, improve maternal health, and strengthening maternity care. So our topic tonight is infant loss. Uh, and awareness turning pain into purpose. And we do have Mrs. Tamika James Isaac with us tonight. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, October is the time of the year where we are excited about the fall. The colors is changing, the temperatures are changing, the scents, the spices, and the holidays are uh, around the corner. But for some families, it can be a sensitive time because October is also Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month. And to provide a little history behind the month, in 1988, President Ronald Reagan declared October as a month to recognize the unique grief of bereaved parents in an effort to demonstrate to support to the many families who have suffered such a tragic loss. Promoting awareness of pregnancy and infant loss not only increases the likelihood that grieving families will receive understanding and support, but also results in improved education and prevention efforts, which may ultimately reduce the incidence of these tragedies. And like I said, we do have Ms. Tamika James with us tonight, and I'm going to read her bio before she uh, begins to share her journey with us. Tamika Isaac is a leading voice for reproductive empowerment, working to eliminate racial disparities in pregnancy care, and advocating for health equity for all. Like most in this space, a life-altering past experience called her to this work. Just one month before her son Jace was due, her and her husband were faced with tragic news that Jace had no fetal heartbeat. While processing that shock, Tamika's life was also at severe risk due to complications of H-E-L-L-P syndrome. Um, and she'll be able to go a little um, in detail about her journey with that. It was later uncovered after Jace's death that Tamika diagnosis that they both could have been easily prevented by routine urine samples that were not provided during her pregnancy. Losing Jace called Tamika and Brandon to re-examine the facts of their medical diagnosis to see what happened, what needed to change, and what could be done to prevent this from happening to anyone. So again, thank you so much for joining us, Tamika, and I'm going to pass it over now to Ms. Matoy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Aisha. Good evening, everyone. As Aisha said, um, I'm Natoya Sanders, and I serve as one of the maternal health coordinators for Six Dimensions. Um, Ms. Isaac, we are just so fortunate to have you here with us tonight. Um, and so, you know, talking about infant loss and awareness, we know that looking at numbers in the United States, about one out of every four pregnancies end in a miscarriage. Um, about one in every 160 pregnancies end in stillbirth. And these numbers don't include infant death from preterm labor. Um, they don't include diagnosis of life-limiting conditions or SIDS. Um, and so I just want to take a minute to, one, thank you for joining, you know, with us today. And we realize that this is an extremely sensitive, you know, yet a very important topic. Um, and I think, you know, for anyone listening to, it's also important for us to remember that grief is not linear, um, that your feelings are completely valid and we just have to be gentle with ourselves, especially during, you know, this time of the year. Um, you know, we experience the unimaginable, but, you know, you're here today to talk to us about 
how you've turned that pain, you know, into to purpose. And so today we really just, you know, we want to acknowledge um, what we have experienced, but we also want to focus on healing, finding our passion and kind of a path forward. So um, again, thank you for joining us. Um, just want to kind of, again, serve as a resource hub, if you would, um, you know, for any parents or families that may be watching today. And, um, you know, this month we talked about is Infant Loss and Awareness Month. And sometimes people just don't know how to support, you know, someone that has um, lost a child. And so in your opinion, what would you say is the best way for families um, and friends to support you during this month and also through the grieving process? So first of all, please, can you call me Tamika and stop calling me Miss Ozzy, please? It's a habit. It's a habit. I know it is, but I'm like, why does she keep calling me Miss Ozzy? It's such a habit. It's feel really uncomfortable. Um, so <laughs> thank you for asking that question. Because first of all, um, it's it's a really it's a really difficult thing thing to navigate if you're someone looking in on it, right? Like. You, you don't know what to say. And most people say some of the dumbest things ever. But I feel like just the acknowledgement that something happened, like just the acknowledgement, like I know that this may be a hard time for you. Just know that I'm here. Like acknowledgement of the fact that there was something that happened to you. And this is a month where, you know, we bring awareness to it because that's really all most people like going through like infant loss just want to be seen. You know, because stillbirth is still, you know, basically a little a kind of a taboo subject in, in some spaces. Um, we talk about it a lot because, you know, that's our experience. But some people feel really uncomfortable. So I think just the acknowledgement that someone lost a child is a really good start because that's how, that's what people just want. You know, that's what people want. They want to be the, they want to be noticed or acknowledge like people to understand that something happened instead of trying to forget it happened or ignore the fact that it happened. So I think that's that's really all you can do. Just show your support during that month and acknowledge that something happened. Right. I think that's good. Um, you know, and, and oftentimes we may get the question like, do you have children or how many children do you have? And it kind of takes that, up, you know, moment and, you know, just acknowledging um, that we are parents, you know, that we are mothers. That's a huge step, you know, in support. So I agree with that um, as well. And I just wanted to kind of loop around and wanted to give you the opportunity to talk about Jace, um, to talk about Jace's journey. And, you know, you, this is your time, your moment to share what you, you know, feel comfortable sharing. Um, but I really would like for, you know, our viewers to you're doing phenomenal things with your <laughs> nonprofit and, you know, want them to hear just about seriously because it takes a amount of strength, you know, to pull from that. And so, yeah, I'll give you opportunity to talk a little bit about Jace's journey and, um, you know, what you have to offer through your nonprofit organization. So just a, a little bit of backstory prior to me getting pregnant, I got pregnant at 40 years old and I, I remember, you know, it was hard. Like it was hard to get pregnant at, at 40. We started when I think we, I started when we, I didn't get married until I was 38, just to put that out there. And in my mind, my whole life, I was like, I'm not going to get married and then like just immediately have children. Like, I just think that you should be married first. Right. But I'm freaking 38. So um, we we tried for a little while and then it didn't work or we couldn't get pregnant. And then I ended up going we ended up going to like a reproductive endocrinologist. And we got, and it was like a weird, awkward feeling when we were there. I don't know. It was just a bad vibe. It was like a bad day. And so we opted out of going that route. We did get some tests done, but we ended up, you know, being able to get pregnant on our own. And like, no, and it was like October of 2017. So, you know, 
I'm pregnant, right? I went to my OB. It's a, I felt like it was like a normal switch over. Like I'd gone him, to him for years. Let me just start this OB. They know me. They have my records. Let's just do this thing. So I went through my pregnancy and it was amazing. Like Jake's was amazing to carry. I didn't have any morning sickness or anything like that. Not a lot, a lot of cravings, didn't really gain a lot of weight. And then at about 33 weeks, I went, I was going to my weekly appointments at this point and they were like, okay, so Jace is, he's measuring, he's measuring small. So they sent me to maternal fetal medicine. So whenever you're over 35, they consider you high risk. Well, they do here. They consider you high risk. And what they told me was I was high risk for preeclampsia and they put me on a low dose of aspirin. So, you know, during my pregnancy, I'm taking the low dose of aspirin, prenatal vitamins and all of the things. So at this 33 week appointment, they actually, I think it was 34. So 34 weeks there, they were like, he's measuring small. Let's go. Um, we're going to send you to maternal fetal, get this ultrasound. So I immediately, immediately go um, that same day. They couldn't read the the scan. So they were like, well, you'll, you have, you have your appointment next week. So just come back next week. So can't went back the, the following, the next week. Uh, he fell a non-stress test. Okay, we send it. We're sending you back to maternal fetal medicine and get another ultrasound. Immediately go, same day. That Monday, I like that Sunday night. I got like a really bad stomach ache, and I it was like in like probably two three o'clock in the morning, and I was like, I thought I had food poisoning, right? So I got up and I tried to go to the bathroom, and then I couldn't use the bathroom, so I ended up throwing up. But I felt better after that. So I just went to sleep. Woke up the next morning. I have this pain in my abdomen, which I'm in my mind. It's like I threw up last night. I haven't thrown up because I didn't have morning sickness. I haven't thrown up in like three, four years, you know. So maybe it's from that. So I kind of laid around in bed and my husband had to go to work. He had called my best friend to come stay with me. So about four o'clock that afternoon, I asked her to come help me go to the bathroom and she came. And when I stood up, I passed out. So I'm now going to be rushed to the hospital in the ambulance. So they send me to the hospital. We get there. By the time my husband's there, we're all in this room. It's six o'clock in the afternoon. I am hooked up to all these things, catheter, IV, fluid, all the, all these things are hooked up to me and they do a Doppler they don't say anything. They come, they do an ultrasound, and then we it gets really quiet and really eerie. And then a doctor walks in, oh, your son died in utero. What? Your son died in utero. Just like that, matter of factly, no emotion, no empathy, no nothing. So me, me and my husband are just like heartbroken. Like, what, what are you talking about? And then it was kind of like brushed off. Like you, we can't really talk about this right now. We can't really focus on this because you have HELP syndrome, which is like a, it's like the cousin to preeclampsia, but it's a critical condition. And they didn't really explain what it was. They're just like, you have HELP syndrome. We have to induce you. And I'm like, you, you just literally told me that my son died. I don't want to be induced. Can you give me a C-section? They were like, no, we have to give you, we have to induce you, but we have to send you to another hospital. So we wait on transport from probably like eight o'clock until 1043 when we finally are in the back of the ambulance on our way to be in, on my way to be induced. A resident at the other hospital, they did a CT scan. She sees it. By luck, of God, by God, she saw it. She happened to read it and told that I was bleeding internally. So they call back to the ambulance and say, did you know she, you know, she's bleeding internally. You have to get her here. So I'm rushed to the OR and I had a liter of blood in my stomach and a softball sized blood clot on my liver. They told my husband, we don't know if she's going to wake up. We've thrown everything at her, but the kitchen sink, we don't know what else to do. So I have no idea any of this stuff is going on in the background. And I, this was a Monday night. I woke up that Wednesday. I held my son for five minutes before somebody came and took him out. Um, I'm intubated. 
I had mitts on my hands. I think they took them off right before I held them. And because I was so sick, I ended up being in the hospital for 45 days and readmitted the day before his funeral. So we never, me and my husband didn't even attend his, his memorial service at all. And when I finally got out of the hospital, I was, I started looking at my medical records because I didn't, you know, your first question is what happened? Like, what, what did I do is what we normally say. What did I do? So I remember one of my friends asking me when I was in the ER, had they been doing urine samples on you? And I was like, no, at the time. And then, you know, when I got out, I remembered her asking me that. So I just happened to be looking at my, I just look, looked at my medical records and they had not done one. And the importance of that is preeclampsia, one of the symptoms is protein in your urine. So they told me I was high risk for preeclampsia. They would check my blood pressure. However, they never checked my urine the whole time I was pregnant, other than to verify my pregnancy in November of 2017. Um, a few, probably a few months after that, someone sent me a link to Kira Johnson's story. And I cried, I cried like a baby. Like I just, it was like, I was dumbstruck. I was like, what in the world is happening? And that same person who asked me about my urine sample, um, she's a she's she's an L and D nurse, and she's been a friend of mine since middle school. So I literally asked her. I was like, "Did this happen because I was black?" And she said, "Yeah." And from that moment, I was just like, "This cannot be real life. Like this cannot be something that's going on today," because we're past this, right? Like as a country, we're past this. And it turns out that we weren't. And that was literally the most traumatic thing me and my husband have ever experienced. Um, it was our first child. He had, you know, I'm 45 now, so I'm perimenopausal, wink, wink. Um, <laughs> and, you know, we, it was just so, so much. And just to hear that story and to know that it happens to other people and to know that we didn't want it to happen to anybody else that we knew. And if we could do something about it, that's what we were going to do. So in 2019, we started Jace's Journey and it really, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just knew I had to do something. It was just like a Ah, I don't know, something, something, we got to do something. It was just too much. It was too much to handle. It was too much to hold on to. I couldn't, I didn't want to keep it a secret. I wanted somebody to hear the story. I wanted people to remember him because I honestly feel like he sacrificed his whole life for me because he, did, he didn't put us in a position to where Brandon would have to choose. He he kind of took one for the team and he was so loved by so many people. And I didn't want his life to be in vain and I wanted it to mean something. So we started Jason's journey. And like I said, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I knew we were going to share our story in the hopes that it would help somebody else or just bring make people aware of like, urine samples. They're like the simplest thing that you can do in a, a doctor's office. And, you know, I've had doulas say, you know what, I've never asked my my patient if they've been doing urine samples. It's something that I think that they do. You know, like that's not something I question because it's it's so automatic. It's such a standard. Like it's one of the main things that they're supposed to do. Um, so over the last four years, we've done a lot of different things. So we've actually done scholarships for doula training. We've provided families with doulas. Um, and I felt like, you know, I don't raise a lot of money. I don't, you know, I don't get grants or anything like that. And we have one fundraiser a year, which is our 5K. That's actually this, this month. We have it during Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month. So I don't have like a lot of money, but I knew I wanted to make a bigger impact. And like a doula here for a family and a doula there for a family really wasn't, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of, I don't want to say control, but 
I can only give it to them and then they go about, you know, I can't, it's like HIPAA violations and all the things. So <laughs> I didn't want to really be that involved, but I did want people to have support because I think one of the important things about pregnancy is that you don't understand. I don't think people really understand how much support you actually need. Pre, you know, prenatal and postpartum, like I, we we don't understand how much happens during that time and what's needed and how your body changes and your mind changes and all those things. And we've gone away so far away from the village that we used to have that people are getting pregnant and being they're alone, especially during COVID. They were alone. And that support is everything because when me and my husband went through this experience if it hadn't been for the people there like my mom coming for two months my uncle coming every weekend my cousin coming every weekend I don't know what we would do they immediately like you guys make sure you get therapy after this like this is insane like this is crazy so they were very supportive in us receiving going to therapy and getting therapy and just being there um, so I want to make sure that people understand like the support that they need, but there's also a gap in health literacy and education. So this year, me and another nonprofit actually started uh, What You Should Know About Black Maternal Health. And our goal is to get to all the HBCUs and just to have a conversation about Black, black maternal health. Like this is what it looks like in North Carolina, you know. Because we have a lot of HBCUs in North Carolina, so of course we started here. Um, just to get, you know, just to start having those conversations because I didn't think I was going to be 40 and pregnant. You know, like when you're you're younger, you oh, I'm going to be 26. I'm going to have this incredible life and I'm going to do all these things. And then time goes by so fast and you don't meet that guy until, you know, you're 38 and you get married. And now you're trying to navigate having a child. And, you know, there are options, but thinking about what you want prior to it actually happening is probably a better route. Um, we don't preconception plan. I probably made that up, but we don't do that. We don't think about, you know, like what. So what if I don't get married at 35? What do I want to do next? Like, do I want to freeze my eggs? Do I want to adopt at some point? Am I willing to do IVF and not have a partner? Is this something I want to do? And not to say that you have to do anything immediately, but just to have the thought in the back of your mind about what's going on. And the numbers are trash <laughs> when it comes to maternal health, especially for Black women. Um, so we need to learn how to partner with our providers. We need to learn how to have those conversations and ask those questions and feel safe asking those questions. There, Every other day, there's a story about somebody not being heard, being disrespected or something like that. So I think it's going to take not only us as a, you know, as Black women and Black families and Black birthing people, but the providers as well. Like we have to, do, we have to change our relationship with healthcare because right now what we're doing isn't working. So my goal is to start having these conversations early to prepare people to navigate doctors to navigate to advocate for themselves to advocate for their families so we can change some of these numbers because doulas can't do it by themselves <laughs> i think we've put and i'm a birth work advocate to my core absolutely but they can't do it by themselves there ha there has to be other people involved it's a community problem basically and it has to have a community solution so that that is what we're doing now at Jason's journey. I talk a lot to a lot of people, and um, I want to. I talk to nurses. I have a few engagements coming up, talking to nurses about like my experience and how we can all partner and work together in order to improve outcomes, especially here in North Carolina. We're not the worst, but we're not that great either. Actually, our maternal mortality review committee just did the numbers for 2020 and 70% of the maternal related deaths are preventable and were preventable in North Carolina. I think that the United States average recently was 80% are preventable, were preventable. So there's a lot of work to do. And like I said, we can't 
put it all on the shoulders of doulas. They can't, <laughs> and midwives, they can't do it all by themselves. So we have to do our part in educating our community about health literacy and health advocacy is my piece of the puzzle. Thank you so much for that, Tamika. You really shared some uh, some valuable information with us, truly, just by talking about what you do uh, with Jace's journey. And thank you for that, especially just uh, being an advocate, not only for yourself, but for Black women as well. We we truly appreciate it. And you, you kind of briefly mentioned this, so uh, I'm going to get the next questions towards this. Uh, what advice would you give parents who are navigating this journey? And how do you find joy in the tough moments? Joy in the tough moments is a, I don't, I don't try to find joy in the tough moments because I'm allowed to have those, right? You know what I'm saying? Like there are moments, what happened to us is unimaginable. Like it's unimaginable. And for me to try to pretend like I'm happy in the moments when I'm not is a disservice to myself. Like I need to embrace the moments of where I feel sad and miss my son or where I feel, I feel angry. And I think for parents going through this, acknowledge that, like own what you feel because it's all valid. Like it whatever you feel is valid at whatever time you 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 feel it but know that you can get past that moment i think the beauty is getting past the moment live in it embrace it but then go past it but don't try don't try to find joy in your sadness because you're allowed to be sad like we we can't be happy all the time. Like we're not, we're emotional people. Like we can't be happy all the time. So I don't try to find joy in my sadness because my sadness is a valid reaction to what happened to me. I think that's a, a good point. I remember someone told me, um, they're like, you're allowed to have that moment. Just don't stay there. Exactly. And, you know, at the time I was like, okay, but I want to stay here. Like, <laughs> you know, this, this is what I need right now. It's comforting sometimes in it a way it can comforting. be. comforting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had to tell myself, like you said, I can give myself that time. But then at some point I have to, you know, but as the seasons change, as different holidays, you know, as different dates approach, our bodies feel that you know, mm -hmm. and our bodies experience that. And I'm the worst. So I'm going to be texting you like. <laughs> you you text me anytime. anytime because, you know, me. I'll be like, okay, okay. Like, get it together, get it together. And it's like, you don't always have to get it together. You like, don't, don't always have to get it together. Space. It is okay <laughs> to be in that space. It is right. okay to be in that space. If it's in the shower, just cry it out. Like, right. I think we are always trying to hide our feelings mm -hmm. and the more we hide our feelings the crazier we become yeah. <laughs> but you know a lot of times we try to hide them because like we don't want to make anybody else uncomfortable i i get that but and it's like why am i doing that you yeah, know right, like why though because right. you know like especially like you talked about you know how people always ask you what well, you do you have kids and do you have mm -hmm. kids so i would you know, like at work, like we have a team meeting and, oh, I have three kids and so and so. I always say I have a still, I have, I have a uh, angel baby. His mm -hmm. name is Chase. Yep. Or I don't have any living children mm -hmm. because I think saying that wakes people up. Right. Like you're going on and on and on about like your three kids and all these things. It also helps you understand that everybody's experiences aren't the same. So First of all, stop asking people how many kids they have. Please, and when they having them and everything else. Yeah. Definitely when they having them. Because. Yeah, like it's, look, uh, uh, yes. <laughs> it's just like, I understand how our how we communicate. Like that's always been a thing. Oh, well, when are you going to have kids and when are you going to do this? But like you said, there's one in six, one in 160 births in in stillbirth like in pregnancies and in stillbirth one in four in the miscarriages 
I've had a miscarriage and a stillbirth. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, you just don't know what people are going through or, or even if they're trying at that moment when you're asking them and they're struggling. You have to keep in mind that everybody's journey is not the same. So just try to be respectful. So that's why I always say, I was like, I don't have any living children. I have one angel baby and his name is Jace. Yeah, and then you try to, and then you try to have to console them. <laughs> right, I know. Then they're like, "Oh my god, I'm so sorry." And I'm like, "Wait, it was my turn. Not yours. It's okay." <laughs> like, but they do. Yeah, I'm like, it's it's fine. You asked me, and I told you so. Okay, right. right. And then, like, like I said, it just kind of helps people to like wake up a little bit. Like, yeah. oh, okay, okay, all right. Yeah, let me stop asking that question. Right, right, yeah. right. So I know when you and I were kind of having a conversation and, you know, we were talking about navigating like, you know, this journey and it's like, it's this club that nobody wants to be a part of, you know, um, but we also find that like, we grieve a little differently than our spouses. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's just because everybody's different. No two people are going to grieve the same, right. um, you know? And so can you talk um, just briefly about like, how to navigate, you know, just if, if there's anyone that's like, oh, I'm going through this and, you know, he's grieving this way, I'm grieving this way, like, you know, just navigating that. I think communication with that is is key. Um, me and Brandon's experiences, though we were in the same experience, they were completely different because not only was Brandon navigating the loss of his son, he was trying to figure out what, I, what was going to happen with my life. So it was he was actually diagnosed with PTSD because it was so much in a very small part of time. You know, like you don't expect to wake up one morning, lose your son and almost lose your wife and then have to try to make decisions to save her life. And they weren't they were not sure if I was going to make it at all. So not only is he grieving his our son without me, because that's something that we should have been sharing in and navigating together he had to do that by himself with the support of my family and his family of course but it was something he he had to do by himself and then you know try to make those decisions for me you know and my life so with him do this me doing you know like speaking about it it's very easy for me now and it gets hard and there are moments what like earlier when I I just started crying but with him, it's a lot harder. You know, it's a lot harder because his experience is a lot different. But to navigate, I try to give him his moments when he has them, and then he gives me mine. But we always check in and like, you all right? <laughs> and he, you know, we always try to check in. But I think communication is like the number one thing. And I think we forget about the dads a lot. You know, it's a, it's a different, it's a different thing for them. And, you know, I've seen a dad grieve by himself because, you know, him and his partner had broken up and I felt so, I felt so bad for him because how do you do that alone? Like, how do you do that by yourself? And I felt so lucky because I do have Brandon to share in this grief with me. And our family, of course, but, you know, to the core is me and him. And I couldn't imagine doing this or navigating this journey without him in it. So, you know, for women, make, it, make sure you check on him. You know, he may not be really open. And a lot of times men try to hide their feelings so you don't, so they don't upset you. But make sure you're not you're not taking all of the you know the i don't want to say um you're not taking all of the grief with you like it's not just yours it's his too so i would just make sure you check in him check in with him and let him be not we Brandon asked me this the other day do you think i'm weak because when i cry you know but it's valid because like you know, if you, you know, 
Ah, oh, you weak. Like, Just you because weak. of our history, men yeah, and like, masculine. Oh, like, yeah. like, no, like, I don't think that, but people do. Like, women think if men cry that they're weak. But I'm like, dude, you, I mean, if you crying about, like, something else, maybe, no. <laughs> but you have a valid reason to be upset or sad. So I think we also have to make them feel comfortable with being vulnerable. And, and being sad because they they get sad. They have emotions just like we do. So communication is definitely the number one thing between spouses or partners. Yeah, I think that's good. Um, you mentioned like communication and sharing your grief, you know, mm-hmm. because like you said, a lot of times the spouse or the partner may feel like they have to be quote unquote strong you know, for you, um, because it's like, okay, well, I know that your body has gone through this. I know that you've experienced this. Um, But I know during like some of our counseling, you know, I was told the same thing that, okay, you have to be mindful that he lost his son and he almost lost his wife. And so for him, it was traumatic too, you know, and again, it's just those differences in grieving there, but it's really important to check in with one another. So I'm I'm really glad, um, you know, that you said that. And I'm glad that you all continue to check in. Tell Brenda it ain't nothing weak about them tears. No, no. Like, they're valid. And the the crazy thing is, the one one thing our therapist told us when we we first started, you know, we did a group therapy. So we did an empty arms group. There's a place here called Kinder Morn. And they kind of like, they do reduce therapy for grieving parents. And the one thing she said was, most marriages don't make it out of this. And I was like, oh God. <laughs> you know, right? For real. Like, you hear that and you like but it's so true. Okay. It's yeah. so true because you know, I've had friends who had gone through the kind of the same thing and they're not with their partner now. But so it's but like that communication thing is really important. Because you have to, you have to, you have to know where you, each other, you know, where, where, where you are. And I think that's in marriage in general. Like you got to check in and be like, okay, <laughs> where, where are we right now? Are we on the same page? Are we going in the same direction? So I think it's the same thing with grief. Like, where are we? Um, what do you need from me? And, you know, vice versa. Yeah, I, I think that's good i don't have anything to add there i mean it's, <laughs> that's it um yeah aisha do you have anything well at this time i am going to go over to the chat on um, the facebook chat if you guys have any questions please put it in the chat so we can um discuss them there is a comment in the chat already from miss cynthia blackman directly to you to me because she said thank you for sharing your story wow so we do have some people in the chat who uh was moved by your story naturally um at this point i do want to we'll wait for some questions to go in but i do want to talk a little bit about a little bit about what six dimensions has coming up next uh on thursday which is october 13th we will be having another uh session geared toward our young women the title is dear young women let's talk contraceptives again it is thursday facebook live please go to our social media pages at six dms instagram to register or for this uh conference we will have not conference i'm sorry session we we will have incentives so please again go register the title is dear young women let's talk contraceptives and you will find the flyer on our facebook page so is there something you want to add I was gonna say okay, as in register tonight because the last time it was uh, sold oh, out yes. and then like well not sold out so but the slots were capacity yeah. yes so definitely yes please go ahead and register for that tonight as soon as possible uh, and again the flyer is on all of our uh, social media pages so Facebook page Instagram the next thing we have is uh, a pregnancy journal can am I showing this. So uh, we offer this for free. And if you would like a copy of it, you can just go to our website, which is uh, www.sixdimensions.com. You could go under the services tab and collect select pregnancy journals. You can select up to 
up to 10. And again, we offer these for free. You can um, get them mailed to you or they are available available for pickup if you're in Jackson, Mississippi or surrounding areas. So again, if you would like a copy of our journal for the black woman, definitely go to our website and submit a copy. I'm sorry, and submit a request so you can get a copy. And now I'll switch it back over to Toya. You go ahead. Oh, no, you're good. Um, so yeah, well, you mentioned our social media. So that's really all I was going to cover is just make sure you guys are following us on social media so you can um, be updated on everything that we have going on um, at Six Dems on Instagram. I was about to say which one. <laughs> at Six Dems on Instagram, at Six Dimensions on Twitter. We now have a LinkedIn page um, and our Six Dimensions Facebook page. Um, and so, yeah, that's about it. Uh, Tamika, did you have anything else that you wanted to share? Um, anything upcoming for any viewers that may be in your area? You have to unmute yourself. Of course, story of my life, Zoom world. Um, you actually don't have to be in the area. Our 5K is on October 30th. It is a Sunday, but you don't have to do it on Sunday. You can register virtually. Um, that's our one from Razor a Year. And I can put, can you put, you can find out more information at our website, www.jacesjourney.org. Um, and you can register there or donate if you want to. But our 5K is a really fun time. I have fun. I'm crazy. You just hand me a mic and I go nuts. Um, <laughs> so uh, this is our fourth year. And it's to raise awareness about pregnancy and infant loss, but also the disparities that are in maternal health now. Um, we, Like I said, we just have a good time. We have a DJ because I'm all about the music. And it's a very loving um, atmosphere. It's a super good vibe. So if you're in the area in North Carolina, we would love to have you there. But like I said, you can also register virtually at www.jasonjourney.org. And I think they put it in the chat. So thank you. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Thank you. Well, that is all I have. Um, yes. We'll be having a resource um, that'll come out this week on social media. So just kind of a downloadable resource, you know, for you guys, some education and advocacy tips um, that you can take a look at and share with your family and friends, um, anybody who's currently expecting, maybe trying to uh, get pregnant or anything of that nature. So be on the lookout for that on our social media. Aisha, you have anything else? Nope, that's all. Thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. Have a good night. Bye-bye.